to, or we have come to, the end of the David story, or even a broader story than that, because we're coming to the end of the Samuel stories. And give me just highlights as we, we kind of approach the end. What are some of the highlights that we have seen in, in First and Second Samuel? What would be things that you would consider worth remembering from First and Second Samuel? David becoming king. Okay, David David becomes king. And what's the situation around David becoming king? Do you remember? Saul. He had... Okay, Saul is yeah, the youngest of, of the sons, uh, Jesse's sons, and um, anointed by Samuel, right? And, and all of these, all the stories that we're looking at one of the remarkable things, and we've mentioned it before, with stories, the stories have meaning. Um, just information doesn't necessarily, by its nature, have meaning. It's just a series of events. But when we take the series of events and shape it, uh, then all of a sudden they have meaning. You know, stories have lessons. And, and that's why stories tend to endure, uh, as opposed to some other things that that aren't quite as uh, memorable in the future. And, and this is what's happening here. You know, he's, he's taking stories that's existed, push, putting them in a narrative, but also shaping the stories themselves so that they have a meaning. And so if we like look at the, the anointing of, of David, uh, what might we glean from that? What might we take from that well, story? Well, I got from that was um, David, so he, he was a, a king anointed by God himself. He was chosen by God. Okay. So I get, I get all of God's, and he, he, God chose the least likely, okay. the youngest, so God right. can do anything with anybody. Okay. And he was a shepherd, so God picked him to be a shepherd over his people. Okay. And the shepherd is caring and all of that. And then we go on further on with David's story, and we see his weaknesses. We see how God works in them. David's a great story. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, we can relate a lot with and humanity and how God works in our lives through, through how the David's story. David it's sort of okay. like the rise and downfall of David. The, 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 the rise and, and fall. Now, what would, what would be some of the things that you would see as part of the rise? What are well, what are well, what are characters? Okay. What what else would you say is is contributing to the rise of, of David? Oh, Certainly, this is God's story, so God is in control of it. Mm -hmm. all. What what do we see with David? Well, he cared for his people. Yeah. Okay, David that David had a concern for his people. Mm -hmm. Okay. What else do we and see to with God David? About okay. David tended tended to talk to God about his. Um, the needs, his needs, and the needs, and and seeking direction. What, what else do we see as David is ascending? He was strong for his people, a good leader. Okay, he was a good leader, strong, and in a lot of different ways, mm -hmm. because he was certainly militarily strong. Because that seems emphasized early on in the story that he was a a great military leader. And and understand, and we're going to even see it in in. An illusion in one of the stories we're looking at the, at the end. Um, we're talking about a time when when you've got warrior kings. So the kings are warriors. Yes. They they aren't generals that are directing. You know they are fighting. They are fighting because that's what they were. Mm -hmm. uh, they were warriors, and so you know you have more more engaged in a very physical way. Um, and that's what, what we see with David. What else do we see? So David is compassionate towards his people. He's, he shows a lot of strength in a lot of areas. He consults God. Uh, and God is certainly involved in this story. Now, you said it was a rise and a fall. So, yes, what, would, what would you say as you look at this story of David? And, of course, there are other characters involved. You know, we've got Samuel that is that's important at the beginning, and we certainly have Saul, Saul that that's important as David is is ascending. Uh, what would you what would you consider David's peak? When does David hit in this story? 
the his his highest point. Oh. When he defeated the Philistines and he set up a city of his own, brought the ark back. Okay. So politically, he was at a peak militarily and then economically. They was really not everybody had food and resources that they needed. Okay, so David, David, what it's really interesting, Denny, what you said, because what we're going to see when we get into the books of the kings, uh, we we haven't seen it so much yet, but we're going to see as we as we enter kings, the the quality of the king is going to really reflect the people. In other words, when the king is is righteous, the people are righteous. When the king is wicked, the people are wicked. Uh, it, it, the, the king almost personifies the people over which he rules. Now, we haven't seen that so much with Saul and David, but we are going to see it as we get into the books of the kings. So when, when Israel or Judah is ruled by an evil king, the people are going to be evil, and therefore God is going to punish the people. You know, going to punish everybody. And, and that's what we're going to start seeing in the books of the kings. Okay, but, so, and, and you kind of alluded to it, you know, things, things politically and kind of focused on David, but in a broader sense, politically things are secure, you know, economically things are going pretty well. It's not just David, but it kind of trickles down to the people. They're involved in this too. So religiously, spiritually, economically, militarily, politically, as he sits in Jerusalem, David is strong. Strong. Okay. And so is his country. Now, that's the pinnacle. You said rise and fall. Yeah. He started to come down. What's the, what's the fall? What, what is the... He met tell a, me about the decline. He, well, he, he met a woman that was married. And Isn't it her. always the case? Yeah. <laughs> he meets a woman, you know, and boom, yeah. everything falls apart. And then he sends, <laughs> he sends her husband out to get killed. You know, you know what? Hmm. That's when they start turning on the air conditioning. Yeah, when they meet a woman, absolutely. <laughs> so he meets a woman, everything starts going to, to, to pot. Uh, in particular, what woman does he meet? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. And, of course, uh, the story of Bathsheba is not a very pleasant story. It's almost like uh, she drained all his energy. You know, all his, you know, when he met her, it's like he just, nothing else mattered as much as she did. You know what I mean? Yeah. His kingdom or... The funny part is, though, she really didn't do anything. She took a bath. Yeah. yeah. He did all the yeah. mischief. Yeah. We're going to put the right. blame on the other side of the coin. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, for a change, huh? Not the <laughs> what can you say? That's, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> that's, uh, that's it. So, um, so we, we end up with uh, a, a decline. And, and really, when we look at it, and I, I'm glad you pointed that out, because she is really, she, she's almost incidental to the story. Um, but yet she gets so much blame. Well, she, well now, but in the story, she, she doesn't. You know, she's, she's not held accountable in the story. Um, but who is? Who is held accountable? David is. David is. And, and, and it's not just one choice, it's a whole series of choices that he makes. And fortunately, we have arrived in our society when people who are caught in situations like that, they openly admit it. And they don't yeah. try to cover it up. Oh, yeah. You know, they 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 admit it and, and are willing to take the consequences of their actions. Well, you know, so we are now at a place where we're not you know, much sort of, better than we David used to be. became almost a coward, as opposed ah, to the way he was. Ah. You know, when he was a, a military, really strong dude. And, yeah. You know, and, and now, just sort of fell off and stayed behind. And, yeah, know. when because that was the initial. You know, when kings go to war. Uh, the um, it, it's interesting you said that because I really hadn't thought about it because he while he's making this plan of how to get rid of Uriah you know kind of you know he's a panic he's a panicked guy but you know this is an intricate plan you know he's thinking about it mm -hmm. you know and he's thinking oh yeah that's a good idea yeah that's a good idea yeah that's a good idea what do you think made him panic well what 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 do you think and I and I think this is really characteristic of of people, that's what people tend to do. Uh, 
continue to do. We'll always do. We what? Yeah, yeah. What? What is the? What's the initial concern? It's probably how the people what people think of him. Okay. Uh, he's the king. You know, yeah. people well, might not like him so much. He doesn't do anything about it. And he <laughs> still stays a coward. Yeah. So what the, causes him? My back to my question. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's that? Well, what, what if if you look at the shape of the story? What, what has David, by taking this course of action, what has David actually done? I mean, he's done, he, he's covering up, and we can identify that. Because in our society, we, people are constantly covering up. You know, that's just what they do. Maybe that's a real negative, because it's happened so often, we've kind of accepted it. Oh, yeah, well, he does, you know, he's doing what everybody does, so we don't care. <laughs> you know, maybe, and that, maybe that's not good. But that's what we've kind of done. In, a, in, a, in the context of this story, though, it's not just that he's covering something up. What is he doing that really reflects not only a, a genuine problem, but a significant change in, in David that's important in the context of this narrative that's being shaped? He's sort of depending on other people to help make his decisions. Okay, he, depending on, on others, and, and, and God really isn't engaged in this. You know, God really isn't engaged in this. And so now we've got, now we've got this, this problem within this, this context. You know, God isn't playing a role in David's decision making. And one of the things you said is, early on, is that David would consult God. That was something important in his character. And, and we don't see God involved here uh, right now. In fact, we don't see God with David playing a huge role again. I love it. You know? So, so this, is, this is what I feel Christians today, the world today, we, we all have a tendency to depend on money, we depend on other people, we depend on this. We need to depend on God. Mm. He's the one that leads and guides us through the Spirit. So I, I love that point of this whole thing. Obviously, everything else is going on, but he's not putting number one in number one place. Yeah, no, like Because the minute you do that, everything changes again. But you know what? When the, you start following that. The funny Go part, the, when, you know, David would talk to God and do mm -hmm. whatever God said, but in between those times, he would get robbed and steal. And, yeah, you know, yeah. So, so there's a lot of stuff going on in David's yeah. character. Well, he, so, but he's in a decline, right? Yeah. And ultimately, what ends up happening to, to David? So David yeah. does does this. What what ends up happening? Okay, he ends up running, uh, hiding. hiding. Why? I don't know why. Because because his son. Son. Okay, yeah, he has he has big problems in his family, right? Mm -hmm. His family kind of falls mm -hmm. falls apart. Do you think part of that was because of what David did? And you know, from the moment he like met Bathsheba. And, and then they became a, a unit, you know. I think uh, that was the consequence of it. Yeah. So what, what with did, his sons. What did, what did Nathan say when he confronted David? Trouble in your family. What's that? He told him there'd be trouble. There'd be trouble in the family. Yeah. There's going to be right. trouble in your house. And that is exactly, that's exactly what happened. So, again, the context is always, this is, this is not... And that's primarily the, st uh, the story of David. This is the story of, it's still the story of God. Absolutely. And, yes. and that David's going to face consequences mm -hmm. for, for his actions. And the consequences are severe. And he never recovers. You know, there's no recovery from the, the consequences. In fact, if anything, what ends up happening to David? As we go through... This. He loses all his his strength. His oh, you know, he, he loses his strength. He, he loses go to his. God all the time and ask. Right. He's reacting. You know his, and and he faces some genuine genuine problems. I mean, he has a son that rebels against him, and then he has another faces another revolution, the sheep re revolt that we talked about last week. So we've got David ending up facing the consequences. 
for his actions. Now again, on, on a couple of levels, this is really interesting, I think, because this redactor is writing this about David. And how will the Jews view David in the future? How will the Jews to whom he's sending this, how do they view David? I don't think they would view him the same way. Well, okay, because the people are viewing David as a, a hero. This is this is the founding of our of our country, you know, the Davidic king. You, you, and, and so it would be really tempting to shape this story. And so let, me, let me tell you how great this guy is and you know, how wonderful he is. But that's not what the redactor does. You know, he gives this side, this other side, which really points the story away from David being this great hero to David being a person who is judged and accountable to God. And, and that becomes kind of what we see in the story. And even a king pays consequences for his action. Even kings pay consequences. If not by the people, because he kind of skirts these re revolts, pays consequences ultimately in the sight of God. You do, that's, that's something you can't skirt. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we, have, we see that with David. Now, if the, if the story ended with where we ended last week, with the the Sheba revolt, and that's that's kind of a, a, a an odd thing because it again points to something we're going to see later in the Book of the Kings, the the breakup between of Judah and the other tribes, the other ten tribes. Uh, you know, we would see David, and then David dies. Then David has reached the end. But then we we we've got these last few chapters, which are interesting. The, the last three chapters in the book of, of 2 Samuel. Because David is David's still alive, right? Mm -hmm. So he's, and, and in fact, he's not going to die in the book of 2 Samuel. He's not going to die until we get to the, the first chapter of the book of the Kings. So what, after, after this thing with, with, with Sheba, you know, the, that is put down, but again, it came with a cost, We've got a divided kingdom that used to be united under David. Uh, we enter chapter 21, and, and what's happening? There's a famine. we got a famine in the land, right? And how long has this famine been going on? Three years. Well, three years. Now, according to the, again, in this story, what does David do? He talked about it. Wait a minute. Whoa. He did what? <laughs> right. He did, he did what? Correct. Talk to God. Sought the face of the Lord. What we're going to see in these last few chapters is they they don't seem to be chronological. Mm -hmm. You know, they they in fact one is he didn't even king. You know, he's in dealing with the Philistines. You know, it, so it's almost like and and it you know this is the way I. This is what I think is happening. I think we've got some stories that after this narrative of David, this has been very clean, you know, this decline has been very clean, you know, all of a sudden he's got stories left over that he believes are really important, but they, they don't fit into his narrative. But he wants the people to know them, to hear them, but they don't fit anywhere else. And so he kind of puts them at the end. Which is okay. I mean, he can do whatever he wants. Um, I mean, he's the, he's the writer. I think, and, and we, you could view it as chronological if you want, that's fine. But there's nothing in here that says, well, this has got to be chronological. I mean, he, he says, show me. Where does it say this is chronological? Yeah, and you know? I don't even think that's all that important. Yeah, I don't think so either. And that's, but that's, I, so I don't think I, this is, this is flows. I don't think this happens after the Sheba, because David is doing something he didn't do anymore, you know, at the end. He's inquiring, and that's something he did a lot earlier, but doesn't do, hasn't done recently. I love what, and I can't remember. Jay, not Jay. I'm sorry. Yeah, I want to say Julie, and it was started with a J, forgive me. So what she said, it's like she, he talked to God, but I love the way the writer puts in, God says to him, I gave you three choices. Mm -hmm. And the part I love is that David said, 
you're a God of mercy. He knows who his yeah. God is. I'm going to let you pick what's going to happen to me. God chooses the lesser of three evils, and then after a certain amount, of, which was only three days, he says, it is enough. H hold on that, sure. because we're going to get there. You know, we're, that's, that's the last chapter. Jesus. That's 24. Jesus. So we're going to get there. Okay. We're going to get there. Okay, <laughs> but here we, got, here, we, here we got a famine, right? We got a famine in the land. And David d does something he hasn't done in a while, right? Yes. He, he goes to God. And, and what does the Lord tell him? Because it was because of okay. Saul. Okay. Now we got something with Saul. Going back to to, to Saul, and what is the problem with with Saul? I mean, what 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 has happened that has caused this fact? That the Lord tells David is the cause of this fact. Because Saul put the Gibeonites. Okay, because the Saul put the Gibeonites to to death. He slaughtered Gibeonites. Well, where does it say he slaughtered Gibeonites? Don't, don't think too hard, he doesn't. There's no mention <laughs> of Saul there, slaughtering that's Gibeonites. That's in, the, me too. I was yeah. back. In, in the narrative, there's no mention. Yeah. But there are mention, there is a mention of Gibeonites. We, in fact, we talked about it in here. Gibeonites. Does, does anybody have any idea? And if you do, you will, you will earn a, a, a jewel in your crown. Now, it'll be garnet. It's not going to be a great one. I mean, it's not going to be like a diamond. But you may get a garnet out of it. Do you remember where the Gibeon, where we talked about the Gibeonites? I don't even know where we are at the moment. Okay, we're in chapter 21. Chapter 21. Okay, chapter 21. Okay, good. Uh, Gibeonites. Way back in the book of Joshua. Remember, Joshua was given a command from God. What was Joshua's command? That, that should make, that made us uncomfortable when we read it and, and should make us uncomfortable. What did God command Joshua when he entered the land? Kill everything. Oh, yeah. Kill everything. Yes. Kill every man, kill every woman, kill every child, kill every animal. animal. Kill everything. You know. And he's doing it. Right? That's what he's doing. In the ninth chapter of Joshua, people that live in the city of Gibeon come up with an idea. Uh, because Joshua is killing everything in sight. And they are, they're sweating out, they're sweating it out. And they decide to dress in raggedy clothes and go to Joshua and say, look at us. You know, yeah, we got nothing. You know, we, we got absolutely nothing. You know, you can kill us if you want, but you know, we're willing to serve you. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll be your slaves. Uh, and we're not a threat because we got nothing. You know, we're just these real poor people. Uh, we just want to survive. And you, you see it in, in chapter 9, 10, and 11 of Joshua. And, um, and Joshua says, without consulting the Lord, Joshua says, sounds like a deal to me. You know, I... I if, if you follow through on what you said, you're going to be our servants. From now on, we won't kill you. And they leave and no, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, and go back to the city and change their clothes. You know, and put on the, the clothes they were wearing because they didn't have nothing. <laughs> you know, they, they, but they still were servants. They still did follow through on what they promised, but they fooled him. They, they, they deceived him, and that's, that was the point. But he said... Joshua said, we have a covenant with you. Therefore, we are not going to kill you. You know, you will serve us. And that's what they've done. Evidently, what has, what did Saul do? And this is the only time we hear it. Saul must have done what? And, and you know, even the writer knows that we haven't seen this before. Because in verse 2, what does the writer do for us? There's a pretty good indication that he knows he hasn't talked about it. 
gives us a little stuff in parentheses, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. You know. Now, let me tell you who the Gibeonites are. You know, they aren't they aren't Jews. They're Amorites, and uh, Israel promised to spare them, which is is rooted grounded in Joshua. So the writer knows that his reader doesn't, doesn't know. That's why he gave us this information. Okay, so anyway, the, so Saul evidently has done this. What does David do as a king? And, you know, again, this, he's acquired of the Lord. What does David do as king? He asked them what that he could do for them. Okay, calls the Gibeonites in. What, what, can, what, what can I do for you? And then, it's interesting. Oh, why did Saul do it? The writer even tells us why Saul wiped them out. Tried to kill so many of them. Why he was trying to wipe them out. Why was, why was Saul trying to kill the Gibeonites? And this is typical Saul. This is in keeping with how the writer has presented Saul. Because they were survivors? Well, what does, this, what does he say? What does the, the redactor say in verse 2? In that little parenthesis. Zeal for Israel Judah. They, because he is so fired up. He was fired up for the Lord. Right? And fired up for the Lord. And so what is he going to do? He's going to kill those burners. Burners in the land. We're going to kill them. Right? How is that, how is that Saul? How does that reflect Saul's character? Why do we read that and say, oh yeah, yeah, that'd be something Saul would do. Was he done it before? Well, he, because Saul, one of his, his great, almost his tragic flaw in looking at Saul is what? What's, it, what's his, this huge flaw within Saul? Wasn't his sincerity. Acting, acting before thinking. Acting before thinking. He's impetuous. He, he acts before he thinks. And he has to act immediately. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't pause and kind of let things work out. He jumps in, jumps in performs a sacrifice before priests come and makes a promise of to, about eating before battle. And, you know, he just does stupid things. He, he acts without thinking. And this is Saul getting all fired up. It wasn't that Saul wasn't religious. He was. But he didn't do what God wanted him to do, which is a, also a good lesson you know, for us. That just being spiritual doesn't mean you're going to necessarily do what God wants you to do uh, or that you'll avoid consequences. So he went and to get these foreigners out of the land. He started killing them, and he just started to kill people that God had, or that Joshua said Jews would not be killed. And he did it anyway. And what, so David calls them in, and what do you want? What, what do you want, Gibeonites? And the Gibeonites say? They have no right to ask for anything, basically. Well, they say. Because David seems to be saying, you know, what deal can we can we cut? Because I, you know, I know what Saul did was wrong. You know, what what can I do for you? Yeah. And the Gibeonites say, give us seven marriages. Yes, put away your checkbook. <laughs> you know, put away your checkbook. We're not looking for gold and silver. What we would like is seven. Descendants, 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 sons, sons of, or descendants of, of Saul. And what are we going to do with them? We're, we're going to impale them. So why does, it, why does it say in chapter 4 where they say they have no right to demand silver so gold, nor do we have the right to put anyone in Israel to death? And then they say they want... Right. What are, what are they saying so, when they say, we don't, we, we don't want stuff, we don't want gold and stuff, and we don't have the right to put anybody to death, because that was a deal that they made sort of with Joshua. So they don't have a right to do it, but who does? King David has a right to send, if King David <coughs> gives them the right, they have the right. You know, if King David says, you know, this is what we're going to do. You give us a seven, and we're going to impale them. Then who's taking a responsibility? They were more or less looking for permission. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, David has given them the right. David has is the one that's acting. In other words, they they can't go and kidnap. 
the Sabbath, or they can't go in and, 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 and kill them themselves. That's why it's got to go through, through David. Yeah, which, which means the Gibeonites, you know, they aren't doing what Joab did. You know, when he just went on his own and sought revenge, you know, on Abner, they're going through channels, mm -hmm. right? They're going through channels, and what does David, what does David do? He gives it to him. Okay, he gives it to him, right? And what do they do? They kill him. They kill him. They impale him. Okay? And one of the mothers, Ziba, or Zipa, what does, how does she respond to her son being impaled? She took sackcloth and spread it out over for herself on a walk. Okay, she, she, which, which means what? When she's doing this she's with mourning. sackcloth. She's mourning, right? Mm -hmm. She's mourning. And, and what, what does David, so as his mother is mourning the death of her son, what does David do? He took the bones of Saul and Jonathan. Okay, he takes the bones All of Saul and Jonathan. And puts berries in the tomb. And, and, and as well as the bones of Saul and uh, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. Who else does he collect? All these other. Yeah, these seven, these seven guys that have been, been killed. You know, and, and sort of gives them a proper burial. burial. Now, this, this little story, and it's not referred to later, what impression do we have of David? He's kind of remorseful of what's happened. He, he does something. This, is this a, a positive impression? Do we get a positive impression of David? Yes. Yeah, I think, I think we do. Yes. Because David does the things that he used to do all the time, right? Mm -hmm. He inquires, you know, problem in the first first thing is talking to God. Mm -hmm. And were the Gibeonites wronged? Yes. Yes. Did they have a right to ask for what they asked for? I think so. Yes, they did. So the Gibeonites are not the they're not the villains here. Saul did wrong. And the Gibeon, he needs he needs to be accountable. And David, because choirs of the Lord, so he knows what's happening. David executes justice, right? I mean, he, now we in the 21st century say, look at this and say, that's horrible. That's terrible that David would turn him over. First century, they had a right to ask for it. You know, they, they had been wronged. Uh, they had been wronged in the sight of God. Saul had violated the covenant they had. Yeah. And, and so they could have asked for a whole lot more than seven, you know, but they didn't. Uh, and David executed justice, but David also did what at the end? So he's acquiring, he's spiritual, he's a just king, but he's also compassionate, compassionate at the end. You know, he shows this compassion that again he doesn't have to show. You know, because we're talking about the descendants of of Saul. He's got no reason. If this, this would appear to have, remember when we had the, the series, there were three stories that, you know, each one showed that special quality of David as king, mm -hmm. you know, and this would be a fourth. Why would the writer not, and this would fit, fit in with that really, really well. Why would he not put this in with those other three? Because he, he sure could. Could have. It would have made the more narrative, made the narrative make more sense. This is just kind of thrown in there. You could read this and say, well, David's now had a change of heart. You know, he's a new man. Well, I don't know that he's a new man. No other indication he's a new man. Uh, I think because three is a really important number. You know, so the three stories, having three stories is really significant. Uh, that you've got three, that's sort of the perfect number. This is the uh, perfect proof that David is, is this good ruler as he's ascending to the peak. This is also a good story, but maybe not as good as the other three. And so I still want you to hear it, but we're not going to put it there. We'll, we'll put it in the appendix. 
uh, for you to look at later. But I think it reinforces the idea that David is this, this the best of kings. You know, kind of makes the downfall even sadder. Mm -hmm. um, and then in verse 15, we're shooting, we've started, we're into another story, right? Mm -hmm. And what's going on in 15? Battle with the Philistines. <laughs> we got a battle. Now, have we been dealing with fighting Philistines lately? <laughs> All the time. You know, well, in the past, yeah. but have we done it lately? lately? No, we haven't. Philistines have been kind of quiet lately. David's been too busy fighting Absalom and, and Sheba. You know, we, the Philistines have been kind of kind of quiet. And, in, and, and how were the Philistines presented here? What's, what's happening in this Philistine story? They're trying to kill David. Now they're trying to, the Philistines are, are trying to kill David. And evidently David is leading, them. Is, is leading, army. Yeah, leading the army. And he's, when you say leading, he is literally leading. Because he is in front fighting off Philistines, right? In fact, he's fighting them off so much he is... He's exhausted, and who steps forward? However you say, been on. Yeah, well, we got a giant, right? Mm -hmm. And how is he described? Handsome. He is. <laughs> <laughs> Where did he get that? Yeah, I don't know that he's handsome. And everybody's handsome. But uh, but <laughs> he is he is quite a man, right? Because he is carrying. A, spear a, spear. a huge, huge spear. All right. So David is weary. He's this giant. And we're going to see there are a lot of other giants wandering around. Um, who steps up and saves the king? Abishai. Okay. Uh, Abishai steps up and slays the giant, kills him. And then what's the result? They tell David, don't do that again. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't lead us anymore. You're too important to lead us. Now, why? And so, boom, we got this little, little story. You know, well, why would this not be? David, we haven't had him fighting Philistines. In fact, we had the Philistines running, you know, when he finally defeated them. They are out of the picture. You know, they're gone, out of the land. And here we're fighting them again. So chronologically, it doesn't make any sense that all of a sudden they're in the middle of this battle. Why wouldn't the writer, it's, it's really interesting, why wouldn't the redactor put, move this story earlier in the narrative? Well, we're talked about David fighting the Philistines. Why would this be part of the appendix along with this other story? Maybe he didn't want to put it in there yet. Okay, now, yeah, now think about what the story does. What does this, what does this, the story does two things that are that's really interesting that, that might cause a little issue, at least in the way it's being, this narrative is being presented. Because all of this is happening, would be happening before David has reached his peak, right? While he's on the uh, ascension. What does this story suggest about David? He's on the way to Yeah, that's right. That, that he isn't, well, again, he's been fighting all day that he's tired. Maybe that's not what the writer wants, to, how he wants to present David at, earlier in the story. You know, that David is, is weary, becomes weary. So that, that would kind of reduce this perfect king image that the writer, because you, you present David as almost perfect, that means his fall is even more dramatic. You know, if he is you know, great, then the fall from greatness is even even steeper. And it's a lot to live up to for your whole lifetime. Yeah, that's right. So this is, this is a story. What else does this story The men say, tell him what? Go to Don't go to battle anymore. Yeah. Now, again, what does that do? Symbolically, they said that the lamp of Israel will not be extinguished. That's right. He's up front. That's right. How does that change the, the, if we move this to where it probably, in a, the narrative, it probably belongs how does that change this, this narrative that the writer has developed? 
But when he was strong and winning all the battles and going with the men, um, he was up front and strong and leading them. That's right. Mm -hmm. And now he's on the weaker end, and they don't want him up front. That's right. Kind of, and it justifies, you know, when we when we read what was in chapter eighteen, where when kings go out to war, David stayed home. Right. Uh huh. Uh huh. That that's kind of I explains it, right? Told, so told, it, that's, that's right. right. Now we, that becomes less dramatic because we've already gotten that idea introduced into the story. Well, why did he stay home? Well, the men wanted to protect him. Well, see, that kind of negate that changes things. It's not then just his decision doing something different than what he was there to do. It, it makes it more complicated. Life is complicated, but stories generally aren't. Stories are generally pretty, pretty clean. You know, so makes a lot of sense. What I find interesting here is why they put it in at all. You know, because if this story weren't there, I, I don't know what this contributes mm -hmm. to the David narrative. Something clearly the writer thinks it does because he's including it. I'm not sure. And then it gets even kind of crazier from my perspective. Then what does he? What does the writer start including in the rest of this little passage? Before we get to the end of, of 21. Other battles. Uh, other battles and uh, focused on. Who was killed? Yeah, on these giants, these Philistine giants that are there, that, that you know, have six fingers and toes and, you know, how big their, their stuff, you know, the, the we their weapons are. Um, what role does this play in, in the narrative? I mean, even, even one of them called Goliath, that David doesn't kill. Somebody else kills him. Uh, what, what, what's the purpose? Now, I'm asking, because I don't know what the purpose is. You know, I don't know why the writer has chosen to, to spend so much time outlining Philistine giants that Israel beats. Yeah, it gives names and descriptions and, uh, you know, geez, when you get into the toes on that, you know, feet and fingers on their hands. And, the only thing I can uh, glean from that and it's going to be on the spiritual side is that in life we face giants. Yeah. We, fight, we face big battles, small battles. And... Um, Even though the writer doesn't really say it, there's people there that protect David, so they still consider him a good king. If he wasn't in, let him kill him. You know, that type of thing. So for me, God is still is with David, protecting him through all these different means. It has more of a spiritual condemnation to me, and it just tells me that in life we all face huge battles, and if it wasn't for God's protection around us, Anyway, that, yeah, that's where yeah. I go with that. I, uh, because I don't, yeah. like you said. It doesn't make, it, it doesn't seem I to fit. I just the spiritual side of Yeah, um, so maybe, I, I, I don't know. So I'm, I'm telling you, I don't know. These just seem to be miscellaneous stories mm -hmm. that the writer has put at the end that you can interpret. There's a reason he's put it in there. What his reason is, I don't know because I wasn't talking to him. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of glean reasons from what so else he's written. I have to tell you, yeah. I listened to your sermon on Mother's Day about the uh, Holy Spirit of God. Hmm. And so whatever you glean from the Word of God, the Spirit's talking to each and every one of us individually. That's how I perceived that spiritually. Hmm. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm trying to remember. Well, you're all careful what you say, because it yeah, was good. I, you know, I, sometimes I don't. You know, that's been a couple of weeks. It's on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I, I put it on YouTube. That's right. Um, that's so, right. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> well, that's good. It was good. Well, that was a, what a wise was person yeah. I was. I said those words that I can't quite remember. Yeah. <laughs> it was impactful. <laughs> I'm quiet. I'm really quiet. Uh, it's it, that's, it's always yes. it's always funny because on, on, on Saturday when I when I because I write my sermons on Saturday and Saturday is a long day it's a long day but if I wrote them on somebody said why don't you write it on Friday I'd love to write them on Friday somebody said well my maybe it was somebody in here was it anybody in? I don't know whose father was a minister 
Because it was somebody that saw, and said, oh, well, my dad always wrote it on Friday. And I said, I would love to be able to write um, my sermon on Friday. I'd love it. The trouble is, if I wrote it on Friday, I'm, well, I would rewrite it on Saturday. Because I would think of a better way to approach it. And so what I do is I'd write two sermons, one of them that I think is obviously better than the other. <laughs> you know? and, 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 and that would be the one I give, and the other one I toss, because I'm not going to use one that's not as... And so that's why I write it on Saturday, because once it's done, it's done. You know, we're not writing it again. You know, we're, <laughs> it, whatever it is, it is. And I'll get home on Saturday. And sometimes it's, you know, it, it's better now than it used to. Sometimes I'd get home at 1230, you know, in the morning. Um, to, so it would be late. Now, usually it's between 9, 930. And Debbie will ask, um, well, how was your sermon? How's the sermon? And sometimes, sometimes, you know, I say, I think it's, I, I, it, it flowed as I was writing it. I think the structure is good. I think it's structurally good, I th and I think I think it's I think it's on point. And other times I'll say it's a mess. <laughs> that that is a mess. Uh, well, or, or and then if it's a mess, I, I'll say we'll have to see tomorrow because it's the next day I rehearse it. And sometimes when I rehearse it, you know, then okay, it it flows better than I thought. But when you finish it, you know, you're looking and you're thinking, Jesus, <laughs> wow, and they pay me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but there's enough times I leave here you saying just the have same to thing. Remember, it's not about you. It's well, all that's about right. God's that's story. right. But we all we are, we're craftsmen. You yeah. know, we're you know I've got to take seriously what I do. If I did, well, you can't you go know, a cartoon. Then yeah. Then <laughs> so anyway. Anyway, we got this miscellaneous story. Okay, we're we're done with that. But I, see, that's what I think he's doing at the end. We got these stories that don't really connect. And then, in chapter 22, we're into something else. And what are we into chapter 22? So Even if you song. look at your Bible, what have we got? David's song. Yeah. We got a psalm, right? That's what we've got. In fact, we've got a psalm that's in the Psalter. You know, because that's Psalm 18. That's moved here. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's all, like I said, I, I think it's fairly accurate that the, the writer has this stuff left over. And what, I, I like it, but I can't fit it into the narrative anywhere else because it's going to change the flow of the narrative. So I'm going to put it at the end. And now I've got a song that I am putting at the end. Now, I told you one of the things that we see, and we... We are, po we're sort of, we've been shaped by rationalism. We're, we're rational people. For the last 250 years, we're rational. Um, and therefore, if, if an author is given, then the author had to have written it. Because that's what we believe. We believe that for 300 years. That if it says by so-and-so, and if somebody else wrote it, and somebody else claims it, if a person wrote it and somebody else claims it, that is called plagiarism. plagiarism. You know, and we make a big deal about it because that's wrong. Well, understand, that's only about 300 years old. You know, we've only thought that way for 300 years, which is fine. It's not bad. In 300 years, we may not think that way anymore, but that's the way we think now. That's not the way ancient people thought. Heck, that's not the way, uh, what, uh, John Adams thought before the American Revolution because he wrote in somebody else's name. So it's not something that was important in the past Certainly not as important now. My point is, when you look at the Psalms, David was associated with playing the harp, was a musician. Mm -hmm. And so anything or a lot of music in the, in the Old Testament is immediately associated with the only musician that you have. It must have been written by David. David. Now... I think that's relatively important to sort of file away because I've heard a lot of folks, ministers and interpreters that are shaped by rational, rational thought, and this is fine, I guess, say, well, when was this written in David's life? When did this happen in David's life? Well, I think, I, I think you're making a mistake because David may not have written it. 
It was attributed to him, but it may not have been written by him. And to somehow tie it to some part in his life when it's not part of the psalm itself, you may be taking a step that's leading you to a misinterpretation. Instead of letting the psalm stand on its own, you're forcing it into a place where it may not belong. Right. Just one thing, just like Solomon, same things want to happen with wisdom. Anything that's any wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, is going to be attributed to Solomon because he was wise. Didn't mean he couldn't have written Ecclesiastes. The language is all wrong. People didn't speak the language that Ecclesiastes had written when Solomon was king. So he was writing in a foreign language that didn't exist yet. So he couldn't have written it. But, you know, well, Solomon must have written it because it says it's by Solomon. Go for it. <laughs> you know, I, that's, that, that's fine. As long as it doesn't lead you astray. Um, anyway, we've got a psalm, and, and what is happening in this, this psalm, and we could go through it in, in detail, but I'm not sure we necessarily need to do it in detail. Uh, what, what is, in, in essence, what's this psalm about? And it, and it, covers, it covers a whole chapter, right? Okay, it's, a, it's about praising, the focus is on praising God. And so as he approaches God in praise, he does what we see in the Psalms, in the Psalter. He, it, you can break it into, into different, different parts. For instance, if you look at verses 1 through 20, if you just scan those, what's going on in 1 through 20? Praising God praising for protecting. God. Okay, for protecting. So yeah. it's a it's praising for God's protection, mm -hmm. and what what in that do, does does it um, would cause you to come to that conclusion? What what in what he has written would point you in that direction? What are some of the things he says that would say, yeah, this is you know David saying, thank you, Lord, for protecting. Smoke rose from his nostrils, consuming the spire. Okay, the smoke coming from his nostrils. Whose nostrils? God's nostrils. You know, smoke, which, which indicates what? Think would indicate anger. Yeah, anger. And, and why is that good? Why is David saying, yeah, that's a good thing? Because what is God doing? Listen. Yeah, he's, he's doing what for David? He's saving him. He's saving him, you know. So if I want to be saved, I want the guy who's saving me to be snorting fire. You know, I want him to be fighting on my side, right? All right, so we got the first part of this, of thanking God for delivering, you know, and delivering, and God has the power to deliver. Therefore, thanking him is, is well-placed. God isn't just hanging around in the background. As things work out, God is what? In charge. God is in charge, right? God is actively engaged in doing this. You know, he's thundering from the heavens. He's sending out bolts of, of, of lightning. And, and notice how often he uses the images of water, drawing me out of, of mighty waters. And that's calling up a, an image symbolism that is really important to ancient people, particularly for the Jews. And we, talk, we talked about it months, maybe a year ago, over a year ago. You know, water is this symbol of, you remember water? Chaos. chaos. Water is a symbol of chaos in the, in the ancient world, uh, particularly for the, for the Jews, but other people as well. Because water, particularly the sea, uh, is something you can't control. You know, you look at, you stand on shore and you look at the, the ocean. You can, you can change the land. I mean, you can change things on the land. You can water, you can plant, you can plow. You can do things. You can move herds of sheep around. You know, you can do things on dry land. But the ocean, you control the waves? Heck no. You control the storms? Heck no. You send boats out? Sometimes they come back. Usually they come back. Sometimes yeah, they, don't. they don't. You don't have any control over that. And so water becomes this, this very natural symbol of chaos. And, and we see that even in Genesis 1, the, the, the first creation story. You know, that God doesn't create out of nothing in Genesis 1. 
God doesn't create out of nothing. Because it says the presence of God, what? Hovered over the face of the deep. You know, so what was at the beginning of creation? Water, water. Water, water. And so the story of creation is God not physically creating a universe, but God doing what? Bringing order out of chaos. Chaos, chaos bringing order out of chaos. Creating a bubble in the midst of the chaos because water surrounds this thing that God has created. This bubble, and that's why the story of the flood is so pertinent. What does God do in the story of the flood? He sends them out in the ark for forty days. He removes the protection, you know, and that's what it says. The windows of the sky open, the springs of the deep open. God just removes His protection, mm -hmm. you know. So chaos reasserts itself onto creation. You know, when God is lifting David out of the water, you know, that's very pertinent, symbolic. Language, you know, he's he's saving God, David, from this this chaos. So we've got him thanking God for what he's done. We've seen like a shift when we get to verse one, like uh, twenty one through twenty eight, and what seems to be going on in twenty one through twenty eight that's a little different. He's got confessing before God his sins. Okay, he's confessing before God his sins, and and what does God do? Forgiveness. He shows forgiveness. So God is, in the first, God is delivering me, right? And in this little second part, when, I'm, when he's confessing and demonstrating his righteousness, God is aware of that, right? You know, God is, is aware of that and forgives because of that. And then we have a little another tonal shift in verse 29. And what do we start to, what does he start talking about in 29 to the end? Then he starts putting light back in his life. Yes, okay. He's, God is putting light, which is really interesting. God is doing what? Now, look at, the, look at the flow. The beginning, God is rescuing, right? God has rescued me from chaos. And now when I turn to God, God is aware of and rewarding of my righteousness. And now at the end, God is doing what? When you said about light, he said to light, and with his help, he can advance against the truth. Okay, so what is God doing for Dave? For he's David? Blessing him. Yes, he's now blessing. Not for just forgiving him, but now he's blessing. And the power that God has can be seen through David. Yes. You know that David, God is infusing David with some of his authority and power. So we've got this nice little flow in this song. You know. Uh, when you look at the Psalms, you have different kinds of Psalms. Um, and and this, is, this is a praise. This is a psalm of praise. That, that this, and, and therefore, David can, can praise God for what God is, is doing. Now, when would this psalm, if, if we did put it, since he's putting it in this, at the end of this narrative on the life of David, so we, we might assume that it's there, and he just chose not to maybe slow down his story. Because remember, this story really was moving. The writer really was pushing this story. Earlier, maybe he didn't want to shove in a psalm, because that would kind of slow down the momentum of his story. It's when, a summary, isn't it? What's that? Like yeah, it, it becomes almost a summary of what David is. And, but it certainly wouldn't be something David would say at the end. You know, because I don't know the David after the second revolt he's had to put down, is saying, thank you, God, for, for infusing me with great power. You know, it, maybe the first part, thank you for saving me, but there doesn't seem to be that optimism at the end of the narrative. So w where this fits, I, I, I don't know. But it doesn't seem to fit well here at the end. Okay, so we've got that. What's going on in 20? So we've got this psalm. What's going on in 23? The writer then tells us what's happening in 23. Last okay, now we're coming in for a, a landing, right? Mm -hmm. And what, how is David described? Now, I want you to notice, we, we, we talked about this a lot when we, when we were in Genesis, but we haven't talked a huge amount about it lately. Remember one of the things we saw in Genesis is if when you look at the stories in Genesis, the different stories, 
there were stories, that, and they seem pretty consistent. There are stories where God is named, or the deity is named God, El, Elohim. That's the name for God, and that's the name given in that story. Consistent. You have other stories where El or Elohim doesn't appear, and what becomes the name for God? Lord. Okay, you, you have these strands, and the Lord stories seem to be over here, and there's something, in, they all have some things in common, and then the God stories are sort of over here, and they have things in common, and the, re, the redactor has sort of put them all together. Well, we haven't seen that very often, but I think we see a glimpse of it here, because the name for God throughout 2 Samuel has consistently been, what has God been called? Lord. Lord. Consistently, Lord. And remember, those are the four letters that no Jew will say out loud. That's why they say Adonai, which is, you know, Lord. That's why they won't say those why? four letters. Well, why wouldn't, why wouldn't you say those four, four letters? Why wouldn't you say the four letters? This is the name of God. Why wouldn't you say that out loud? Why would the Jews not do that? Think it's right. Well, good. Why don't they think that's right? They don't have the um, right to do it. Yes, that is exactly right. Wow. You don't have you don't have the right to say the name of God because if I say the name of God, what am I suggesting? Yourself. What's that? You're placing yourself. On yes. yes, both yeah. of you. That's right. That that I have power over God. Yeah. I'm acting in His name. And, you know, when you think about, you know, legally, if I'm acting in somebody else's name, then I can do what? Whatever you want. I can do whatever <laughs> I think they want me to do. What I think they want me to do. And so the Jews are very careful. You do not say the name of God because that's suggesting you have power over God. Jesus will say the same thing about demons. You know, when do demons lose their power? He says it. What do you do to take the power away from demons? You name them. You name them. When demons have names, when you name them, that's why they'll ask, what's your name? When you name it, they lose the power. They lose power. You don't do that with God. So you don't say the name of God out loud. Those four letters, it's the proper name of God. Instead, they would use the word Adonai when they would read this text. They didn't even put, they didn't even put vowel points. The Hebrew language... The written language was initially not to be read out loud. Uh, it was just to be read, but not articulated. To articulate, you need consonants and, and, and uh, vowels. The name of God, they don't put vowel points. If you look at a page of Hebrew, you'll see all these letters, and then underneath them, dashes and dots. They won't, you won't accept when you get to the name of God. And there won't be any dashes and dots under it because no Jew is supposed to say those four letters. Instead, when you're reading the text out loud and you hit those four letters, you say Adonai, which is a completely different word that translated into Greek is Kyrios, which is translated into English, Lord. That's why whenever you see in your Bible the Lord in all caps, Usually it's, a, it's small caps, you know, cap, big first letter and small O-R-D. When you see that in your Bible, those, that's the proper name of God. That's the word there. Uh, that's, that's the word used. Well, that becomes really important because Adonai, the word Adonai is also used as a word, but it doesn't mean the same thing. you got to throw in Yahweh. Well, yeah. one of the things with, and, and I'm always personally, and this is me, I'm personally uncomfortable. Yeah. with that because what I'm doing is what the Jews say you should never do right. you, you should never use that word uh, because you're suggesting and you got a lot of English some English translations you're suggesting what with Yahweh I know they're not to say it matter of fact it's more like a I, I would say I would what I would say is you say Lord and that's what m most translations have but you have some the Jerusalem Bible translation translates it Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think that's unfortunate. I mean, you can do it, but I, it, it, to me it takes away that Jewish intention. 
that this is the word you do not you do not say. And sort of for me, respect for what they believe. You know, I'm not going to do it. What's what's interesting, and we're going to finish this out. Uh, the um, the word Jehovah. It's a, it's a fascinating word because that's not Jewish at all. Jehovah's not in the Bible at all. It doesn't. Even, it is. It is not a. Jehovah's not even a word. It's an English word, but it's not a Jewish word. Hmm. You won't find Jehovah anywhere in Judaism. What they did with the, the the name for God has no vowels, so you, you really can't pronounce it. it. That's why they don't put vowels in it. Uh, you can kind of do it if you work at it, but it's, that's why they don't put vowel points on it. If you take the vowels from the word Adonai and take those vowels and put it into those four letters that spell the proper name of God, now you have Jehovah. So Jehovah is, the, is sort of a created word taking consonants from one word and adding vowels from another and you get a word, a new word, Jehovah, which doesn't exist. If you say that to a Jew, Jew would, I mean, it doesn't exist. It's Church not a word. Church of God has all the names. They have them up at yeah. the names. Yeah, they're all way. So yeah. Jeho- isn't there, I know there is somewhere in here where, I don't know if it was Jesus was taking out one of the evil spirits and he told him to say his name? Yeah. Okay, so that kind of, that's what reminded me of here mm-hmm. was that. I knew yeah. it. I knew it. I think the part I love of the Bible when um, and you talk about the name of God and when Moses said to him, who shall I say sent me? And he said, I am. I am. Yep. Great. I am. What more can you say? <laughs> I am. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's the name. Yeah. That's the name we don't say. Um, and that's a whole thing with, with how John uses Gone to another study. Yeah, that's a whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we've, we've got David um, and let's, because we, again, we're talking about paws and tails right here. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't want to belabor this. I sure don't want to pick up on it next week. Um, when, how, is, how does this end? Let's, let's tie this up because we got a lot of stuff. We, we got a narrative about different warriors, you know, three warriors. We've got this business about um, uh, 30 chiefs. They come and and three warriors and again it's back when David was fighting. You know the Philistines were fighting David and he got water and poured the water out. What's what do we get from these these last stories? I mean what? Well, let's just what are these? What are the topics that that the writer includes? Because there's really no tie between them. It's like there's no narrative anymore. We just talk about the different people that fought against each other. Yeah, you know, we get over get like the Philistines. Like yeah, we got they identifying David's warriors. Yeah. You know, and and the, the the business David's in a cave. But when was David in a cave? Running from Saul. Yeah, when he was running for Saul. This was a long time ago. This was in first first Samuel. He was in a in a cave, and the Philistines were there, and. What was it about the the three chiefs of the thirty? Get him. He says to him, "What? What does he tell him? He needs. He's thirsty. Bring me water. But I want I want water from Bethlehem. You know. And and what do they do? But Bethlehem is in Philistine in the hands of the Philistines. They go get it for him. They go get it for him, and when they bring it to him, he offers it to God. Yeah, he pulls it out, which must have made those three guys really happy <laughs> that they'd risk their life to get it for David, and then he pours it out because, you know, he shouldn't be getting water, you know, for you know, the risking their life to get water for him. And yeah. uh, it's, it's an interesting little story that may have a meaning, you know, dedication to God, but certainly it doesn't fit at the end of the David story. And then the last story, and, and about the 30, he lists the 30 people and why some of them are one of the three. And, uh, what, how does, what about 24? What's, what's going on in chapter 24? He counts how many fighting men he has. Oh, okay. to kind of sum them up. What does he do? What, what is he doing in chapter 24? 
He don't take a census. He takes a census. You know, he's taking a census. And, and it, it's led, the, the motivation for the census is... Right. You, well, well, the anger of the Lord is kindled oh. against Israel. Yeah, because it's all in this, it's in a God context because this is evidently a story that isn't one of the later ones because David seems to have pretty strong control here. You know, he's not fighting rebellions. Uh, so the, the God is angry at the Israelites, but does he, do we know why? No. But because the Lord is angry with them, David does what? Go and take a census, right? Yeah. And Joab says to him, you know, you got a lot of kids, you got a lot of people, but why do we need to Get more. Yeah, why do we need to count them? Oh, yeah. You know, why, why do we need to count them? But, but David says, So I know how many there yeah, are. Yeah, you got to do it anyway. And so what does Joab do? He says, May the Lord your God multiply the troops. Yeah. The yeah. And so he does, he goes and counts, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then how does David react once he gets to report and finds out how many? What, what does David then end up doing? Ask for he asks for forgiveness. Oh, uh, yeah. And you know, there's a certain amount of irony here because why would the king, why would this be really an astute thing for a king to do, to do a census? What does it, what does it give? What does it give a king? I mean, there's a reason why we have censuses in the United States. He feels like he's got more power. He get more power. What, what do you do with a census? Nothing. Oh, that's, that's it. That's right. You know where people are, so you tax them. What else? What else can you do to them? They got control. You you could call them up to be in your military. You can you can call them up to build something. You know where they are if you want a construction. This is exactly what Samuel said earlier. This is what kings are going to do. You know they're going to take your people. They're going to work it because that's what kings do. That you're going to fight their wars uh, whether you want to fight them or not because then you're going to pay taxes. And that's what censuses do. I mean, it tells you exactly where people are. And uh, that's what David has done. He feels remorse, which doesn't seem to be a characteristic at the end of his, his life. Uh, and he ends up doing what at the very end of the story? Builds an altar. Builds an altar, buys, you know, the floor of a threshing floor, threshing floor uh, for an, an altar. Uh, he also, God said because of this, and this is your, the story you talked about, that uh, because he's done this, and again we're sort of getting blending the king and country, you know what the king does, country pays the consequences for it, the king is good, the country's good, the king is bad, the country well, suffers, going on you know, <laughs> suffer, country suffers, yeah, you know. So um, what, what does, so David confesses, what does the prophet tell David? Since you have done this wrong, God's given you, you can select the prize behind one of three curtains. What's behind curtain number one? Three years of famine. What's behind curtain number two? Three months of running away from your enemy. What's behind curtain number three? Okay, you're going to have three days of pestilence. So you get to choose. It's, it's really interesting. David makes, doesn't make a choice, but he chooses the curtain he doesn't want. What, 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 what curtain does he not choose? He doesn't choose one. Shake, running away from my enemies. That's not the choice. You know, I don't, the enemy, my enemies are not going to be given power. I don't want the human enemies to be given power. Therefore, I don't want to be running away from my foes. So I'll take either curtain number one or curtain number three. And what curtain does God choose? A curtain number three. And so the pestilences of the land, uh, what does David end up doing in the face of this pestilence? Now he makes the offering. 
gets the thrashing floor and ox offers an oxen and you know things are nice. The pestilence, the plague is gone, you know, from Israel. It's it's kind of like this is the last of the stories, and the writer is done. So what do we take from not these stories? Because these stories, like I told my father used to say, a, a guy my dad had the ability to recognize. We all have gifts. God has given us all gifts. My dad had a really has a lot of gifts. One in particular. My father can, and this is amazing. He can identify a toupee. <laughs> no. He has the ability to recognize a toupee. Even a really good one. He can always recognize it. From the time I was a kid, he could he could spot him in a crowd. That guy's wearing a toupee. And so you kind of get close to him and yeah, there's a slight difference and you know, all the hair is ending at the same place around. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it looks like a toupee to me. Um, and when a toupee, but dad would recognize that certain toupees were good and certain toupees weren't. Ted Dancing has a wonderful toupee, mm -hmm. dad would say, great toupee. So good that you didn't even yeah, notice it. No yes, idea. he had a he has a great toupee. Uh, so, but others weren't so great. And when you, Dad's a description of that toupee would be, he'd say that toupee looks like paws and tails. You know, paws and tails, paws and tails. You know, that's what it was like. Bits and pieces of animals yeah. were just glued to his head. And not even the good parts, you know, the paws and tails. And that was his. This is kind of what we're looking at with these stories. These I, hit me as kind of paws and tails. Each of them, they have meaning, but I think they're sort of an accumulation. What, what do we take from these stories? What is the legacy David leaves? If we say Samuel, the books of Samuel, is, is really about, primarily about God, mm -hmm. David is the human protagonist. Yes. Through most of it, what what becomes his legacy as we leave the books of Samuel? Well, yeah. his love of the Lord. Okay, you know, and his his always going, mostly always going to God for guidance. When David was was good, yes, you know, he would go to the Lord. Yes, that was part of his legacy. What else is part of David's legacy? that we, we are going to carry with us. So we have this example. What else do we have as we leave these books? I mean, you know, thing like, for instance, David killing a giant. Like okay, David. David's, you know, bravery. Yes. You know, although when we looked at the giant, you know, he was using, he used his skills, his shepherding skills. I mean, mm -hmm. he would fight bears off with, you yeah. know, a sling. Yeah. So he knew how to use a sling. Uh, so David not only was brave, but also smart enough to use what he had to his advantage. Okay, what else? So we take that. What else do we take? What else is David's legacy? God made a promise to David, didn't he? What is what is God? What was God's promise that He made to David? Remember when David gets into Jerusalem, moves the, the ark into the into the city. He gets cedar from Lebanon and builds a palace. What does David decide he's going to do? Oh. He's going to build a temple, a house for God. And through and Nathan, his advisor, says yes until God speaks to Nathan, and Nathan says to him, "No." no. no. What is God's promise to David? Build him. I'm going to build you a house. You're not going to build me a house. I'm going to build you a house. And what is the house that God is going to build for David? It's going to be his lineage. And that, that Davidic king is going to be, remember I told you, becomes one of those, one of the things Jews will look to to be reminded that God is with them. Mm -hmm. They're looking for signs. One of the signs is they've been given land all the way back to Abraham. We have the land. So long as we have the land, we know God is with us. We have the law through Moses. As long as we have the law, we know God is with us, and we have a Davidic king. And as long as we have a Davidic king, we know that God is with us. 
So this is something that's kind of being established. We see that in the New Testament, carried over in the New Testament too. Uh, on the negative side, what are some of the, so the, there are a lot of positive legacies he leaves. What are some of the negative, more negative ones that may play a part in the future stories? How he was weak. With, okay. With the story of Sheba. Yeah, the, the, there's, a, there's a weakness, and the weakness was a result of, of, not of what? Of not, of not following God. It's a, consequences of choices that he's yeah. made. So legacy, a negative legacy, maybe it's negative, maybe it's not, that behavior has consequences. God God's not, didn't bail David out. He had to pay the consequences of his actions. Um, and that's, that's certainly a legacy that he's leaving. What else? Near the end of the story, what happens near the end, end of the David stories? And I'm not talking about these paws and tails. I'm talking about the end of the stories we looked at last week. What's the situation? Well, he does listen to his men when they tell him not to go out. Okay, Even he, before this story, that's right. this other, he, they told him not to Don't, And he's standing he's at the gate. Him. Yeah, he's, he's, just, he's just standing there wait, sitting yeah. and waiting for the news. Yeah. Remember the story of Sheba? Remember the story of, of Sheba? What, what happened with, with him? that may be pertinent as we move into the books of the kings. He took the rest of the other ten tribes. Okay. Remember, it was at a break between Judah and the other ten tribes. Because the ten tribes were jealous of Judah, Absalom's tribe, David's tribe. And Sheba was able to do what to those ten tribes? Bring them together, Bring them away. away, and and that that break that we see on, when David is king, that break between the ten tribes, ten northern tribes, and Judah, and and what what will be Benjamin, but Simeon is in there too, uh, the 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 tribes of the south. That's that's going to be something important that we want to file away. Because the break has already occurred, there's a fraction, a, frac uh, a fracture, there that may widen as we look at the the books of the kings. You know what what's going to happen in this confederation of of tribes. So we David becomes really a more complex, I think, a more complex figure when we look at the books of Samuel than if we just read. The, the Bible stories mm -hmm. on David. Because in the Bible story, David's a pretty good guy. Pretty good guy. Made a mistake, but still was a pretty good guy. Redactor of Samuel, books of Samuel, I'm not sure. But it, you know, but it's he, more complicated than that. But it, it just seems like a sort of like an oxymoron or something. He, he'll go and pray to God and ask him what to do, and God will tell him, and he'll go do that. Mm -hmm. And then after that part, the him and him go walk and steal from other people and bring it back. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's like two sides of the coin. It's just. Right. Well, and, and one of the things, and just as to file away as we deal with that, because I think the writer is, is fairly careful to make David really good and then slack. And that's why he doesn't muddy it up with some of these other stories. Um, from, from an ancient perspective, even when he was raiding, um, when he was in Ziglag and was raiding, where did he not raid? Even though the kings of the king of Gath, the Philistines, thought he was, because he'd tell them, he wasn't raiding Israelites. He was raiding other people. And so I think, um, the, again, that may be a 21st century perspective. I'm not sure that was when the writer included that story. I don't know that he saw that as a negative, that David was, was raiding, because that's kind of what people did. You know, that's what kings did. So it, it certainly is something that we have to grapple with um, as modern readers, because, and that, but that's what we have to do with the Bible anyway, because as modern readers, there are things in the Bible that don't make sense. I mean, why can't we eat shellfish? I mean, that seems pretty arbitrary. Why did God say we can't have lobster? Well, that's pretty stupid. You know, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it, it does 
4,000 years ago makes sense. When you don't have refrigeration, that's pretty dangerous to be eating shellfish. You know? But we have refrigeration now, which means maybe God wouldn't make it a commandment now. You know, so it, it, it's, you, you almost have to get into a, a, a kind of a, a, Evolution. a... Yeah, an ancient perspective and read it that way. It it's, gets a little dangerous when we take a 21st century perspective and assume that they were thinking like we think. Because they just weren't. They couldn't. How could they? They haven't accumulated enough knowledge. You know? And in 2,000 years, people will have a whole lot more knowledge than we have now. And they'll look at us and say, how could they have been so incredibly stupid? <laughs> you know, do you realize? You know what they were doing to cure diseases? You never believe what they were doing. They take a knife and cut through skin and flesh and bone and muscle to treat somebody. Talk about Barbaric. <laughs> How can you believe that people were actually doing that kind of stuff? But they did it. You know, a thousand years ago, that's the way they did it. You know, it's that's it. Things change. And and that's that's what also makes scripture both challenging and exciting because it's getting in that mindset and then bringing the word. The cloven feet. Not to eat anything of the cloven feet. Mm -hmm. So pork was definitely right. one of those, and mm -hmm. to me that would be, it's more symbolic than whether you eat the flesh of that or whatever, it's a dirty animal. So there you go, I yes. said stay away from the dirt. What did my, stay what, in the light. What did your grandmother, I'll guarantee your grandmother said it about pork. What did she used to say about pork? I don't know, in French we ate everything pork. Well, but, but <laughs> yeah you did, so did we, but what did, what did they say about it? You better, you better cook it. Cook yeah. well. You better oh, yeah. cook, cook it well. well. Yes, yes, yes. You know, it yeah. better not be pink because if it's at all pink, you'll get worms. Yep. Yes. You'll get worms. Yeah. Uh, because pork, yeah, you'll get worms. Well, I mean, that's what we, good night, that's what I grew up with my grandmother saying. My mother said, yes. my wife still says it. You know, yeah. when I watch these cooking shows and they're saying, oh yeah, pork can be pink. Pork. Pork can be pink. So New you know, Orleans. That can be that pork can be pink because it, you don't have worms in it anymore. Oh, it can be pink. Chicken shouldn't, but pork can be. And my wife, if you ask my wife, uh -huh, if I put a put a pork loin in front of her that's a little bit juicy, you know, she won't eat it. It's got to be dried out. You got to flake it. Like you my know. mother in laws roast. <laughs> By the time I got done, it was a hockey puck. <laughs> yeah. My grandmother, you, you took a chisel and chiseled off chips. It's like, you know what it's like if you've ever seen that, uh, that uh, uh, Christmas vacation movie and they eat the turkey? Yeah. That was my grand grandmother's roast. You cut it in and it goes, <laughs> Only a roast was, you know, yeah, it was like charcoal. What about Buddha? What about Buddha? Buddha. Buddha. Buddha, that's a French word for blood sausage. Oh, blood sausage. Oh, oh. oh. Uh, <laughs> and do we? We used to, in, in South Louisiana, and do we? Oh, yeah. We, we have Andouille sausage. And I have Andouille sausage. sausage. When I was it's a, a child, sausage. I couldn't no. wait to eat it. It's a blood sausage. Meters out of your blood in it. Well, they, 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 that's part of what they Thanks. put in the grind. Yeah. Oh, because yeah. I know we lived on a farm in Indiana, and, and the farm on the other side of like the main road saying, mm -hmm. okay, they would story? hang up their, What's their your story? animals and drain the blood, mm -hmm. and then they would make blood for it. I, I just the thought of that made me gag. Hey, you know, in, in, um, in the Sahara, Sahara just Sub-Sahara, you know, that's what the Maasai tribes in, in Sub-Sahara Africa, or Sahara Africa, I mean, they have cattle, and they don't, but they don't eat their cattle. They, they milk and they bleed the mm -hmm. cattle because blood is protein yeah. and you can't afford to slaughter. You slaughter a cow, you're, you're taking away a lot of potential protein to, to have you know, a roast. So that what they do is they bleed it. They bleed their cattle yeah. and, and yeah. mix it with the milk and that gives them protein to survive yeah. that's because that's what they do. Yeah. So, yeah. I have a so, so let's go, let's pork. have lunch. I have a recipe <laughs> hint about pork, and I just came across this. I can't believe 75 years and I just figured this out. But it was through Google. So, pork chops and pork tends to be dry yes. because you cook it. Yeah. 
So I just read this through Google, and the Chinese do this, and you take um, baking soda. So like I got pork chops, and I tried it the other day, first time. Very pleased. Oh. So you got pork chops, and I just wet them, and then I take a little handful of baking soda, and you just do this oh. on each side of the pork chop. Not a whole lot, because you put it in the refrigerator for 15 minutes. You take the pork chop out, you rinse it off, or whatever it is, and you cook that thing the way you would normally cook, however you cook. Moist, oh, really? tender, wow. moist. I was like, oh my gosh, I just learned this trick. So, <laughs> for all of you ladies <laughs> that want to cook a <coughs> your wife, and, and your wife. Well, and yeah. Well, there, yeah, advise I, or I, leave a message. I cook a lot. Oh, okay. there you I go. Do, yeah, yeah. I do most there you of go. It. Yeah. A little bit of that. I love I was chops. amazed I did, yeah. how moist, because <laughs> I don't like pork chops. They're too I dry. I don't either. And it was moist and tender, and they yeah. advise not to leave it in there longer than 15 minutes, because then your meat's going to turn to mush. Yeah. Kind of makes sense oh, to me for there's a salt gross. contents in the baking soda, which draws in the juices of the pork. You rinse it off. So you don't have, but the juices have already been pulled into the pork. And then when you cook it, mm. it's going to stay huh. moist. It just makes sense to me. Yeah. I don't know why huh. I didn't. Anyway, have to try it. I'm hoping ba like Now, baking it. soda, because I heard... Baking soda. Not powder. Soda. No, no, not, there's no salt in powder. Okay. Yeah. You just, it needs so we're salt. using baking soda? soda? Baking soda. Okay. But it's, 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 it's this. Yeah. 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 You, know, yeah. you don't have to cover the whole thing, just... Yeah. It's one of these numbers. <laughs> on both sides, no, 15 well, minutes. Good. I'm going to try that. Well, let's have a word of prayer and then we... <laughs> yeah. We'll eat something. Yeah. <laughs> Lord, God, thank you so much for giving us this time uh, as we explored uh, the story of David. Uh, help us to, to claim those positive aspects of his character and integrate them into ourse ourselves, but also help us to recognize uh, his weaknesses. And if those are also our weaknesses, and often they are, uh, help us to be aware of it and help us to, to do what would be appropriate in reducing their influence on our lives. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. And what are we supposed